So good afternoon to everybody. We finished the lecture about the sources of demographic information. And I just want to show you some few slides, some few databases where you can uh, collect data and it's all available for free. This one's that I'm gonna show you online. So if you just go to our course website and then you scroll down after all the uh, lecture materials, you will see starting here with like some websites about the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's something that I went through some of this, like the Our World in Data, in the data from the website from the Johns Hopkins University and also Wordometer. This I showed you at the beginning of this course, the beginning of the semester. And here I'm gonna show you some more. The, this uh, series of websites here, they're all within the domain of the US Census Bureau. And they have so many different systems, but now they recently released this new website called data.census.gov in which they try to have all data sets organized in the same place. So if you click here, you're gonna go to this website and here it pretty much works in the same way as you do a Google search. So let's say for example, you wanna have analysis of fertility. So you just type the keyword and then it's gonna give you a series of different data that they have. Of course, if you wanna have something more specific, you can write that like fertility rates by race, ethnicity or by age and so on. And here you have like a lot of tables, maps and that you can access them for, for free on your, uh, on your computer. And the tricky thing about like each one of all these different websites that I'm gonna show you is that each one of them have a different system and um, and so it's just, you can get, you, you have to learn a little bit about each one of them, but then uh, it's just um, interesting to, to go through this website here and check specific data that you might have, might want to access. So for example, let me see tables for fertility. And then you have the estimate of the overall population and I selected Texas in the previous map. That's why I just showing Texas here. And you have the population here for all the specific age groups or for the specific age groups, race, ethnicity, nativity, education, attainment. And let me just see if for the specific case of women with births in the past 12 months. So you have it here. So 390 thousand women between the ages of 15 to 50 had a child in the last year out of a total of 7.1 uh, 7.1 million women in in Texas for that specific for that specific year and we are talking about data from the 2019 American Community Survey and then that gives an estimate of 55 births in the last year for every 1,000 women, right? So this is all data that you can collect from this website. And it, like I said, it works as, um, as a Google search. And then you have like different websites where you can access the American Community Survey. So let me just close this one here. The American Community Survey, that's the official website and you can collect data. And that second link that I put here is that link that you can go directly to download the data. And this data that you can download from this website, it's the micro data. You remember that I, I explained to you what micro data is earlier in the semester. 
in which you have one row for each observation. The American Community Survey specifically collects information for every individual within the households that are selecting their sample. So for the individual files, you're gonna have one row for each individual and one column for each variable, for each question, characteristic that was collected. And you might also have the information at the household level. So one row for each household and then the variables could be how many cars they have, what's the total income that the um, residents in that household have. So that's a place where you can access the data from the ACS. There is another place that I usually like to collect data from the ACS is the IPOMS website. So the IPOMS website is this integrated public use microdata series. It's organized by the, by the Minnesota Population Center within the University of Minnesota. And they collect information from the American Community Survey and censuses for the US, but also for all over the, the world. So if you go here to this website, it's exactly this one here, ipoms.org. And this uh, specific sub portal here, IPOMS USA, you have data from the ACS and the census in the US. So if you just click here, browse and select data, you can select the specific years that you can analyze, get data from. So the ACS started being collected uh, since the end of, of the 90s, but usually the more reliable ones are the ones that started in 2005. But you also have the databases that were collected through the census in, in previous decades. And remember, these ones here are not the census of like collecting data for the whole population. This is data from the long form questionnaire, the one that has more questions to people. And then you can call it, and then they are also for specific uh, samples of your population. So in 1960, for example, 5% of the households were interviewed. Same thing in 1980, 1990, and 2000. And then in 2000, in 2000 was the last time that we had the long form questionnaire be implemented in the census. And then afterwards, it started to collect it through the ACS every year. But these previous selections here are exactly the um, more long form questionnaire collected through ACS and uh, the census. You, still, you also have the full count, the short form questionnaire for these years here. And the, the full count, it's, um, available for more older years, so you don't have issues of confidentiality in this case to identify specific people. And you also have the Puerto Rican Community Survey. After you select the service that you want, you can come here and select the variables, the specific variables that you wanna analyze. For example, you want some demographic variables. And then you can, I wanna have a variable for sex, age, and let's say that I also want to analyze race ethnicity. So I can collect, I can select variables for race, Hispanic origin. And then I will go to my cart. And here pretty much I have a summary of the variables that I collected. I have some standard variables that are always collected, but I here selected sex, age, race, and, and Hispanic origin. And then I can ask IPOMS to create a data extract and I have to log in, I just have to make an account here for free. And what's gonna give me afterwards is gonna be exactly the micro data for uh, that specific year, for those specific years that I selected in the US. So one row for each individual that was interviewed and one column for each one of these variables, which are the variables, this one's here. So these variables will appear in the columns. So we have years that I select all those different years and then age and sex of each one of the participants and so on. The analysis of this kind of data, you can learn, for example, there is a course in the sociology web uh, department called Advanced Methods of Social Research. It's a SOCHI 
420 that the professors usually show you how to analyze this kind of micro data, right? And then just going back here a little bit up again into the Census Bureau websites, the Census Flowers map is just interesting when you click there, you go here, and then if you click here, this page opens. You can see, have some idea of um, migration between counties in the US. And you can have net migration or out migration or in migration. And here, I just selected the Brazos County, just to have information, Brazos County is here selected in red in the middle of the map. And then you see, usually where people are coming from. So these places here in uh, orange, they are places that are sending between one and 757 people to Brazos County between 2014 and 18. And the darker areas here, they are sending between 2000, uh, sorry, 758 to 3,800. The outbound are places where you see more people migrating out of the Brazos County. And then the net migration, in this case is internal migration. You see areas that are um, gaining more migrants from uh, Brazos County and here areas that are losing more than receiving from Brazos County. So this website here is more focus on internal migration in the US. And keep going further, the DHS program has the demographic and health surveys. The demographic and health surveys are those surveys that focus more on fertility, mortality, and reproductive health, as I mentioned before. And they are implemented in developing countries because usually developing countries don't have uh, enough money to have their own surveys and censuses, a lot of them so often. So these different organizations, the USAID and some other international organizations help fund the collection of data in these developing countries. And the same way as the IPUMS, the DHS data that you download here is micro data. So you have one row for each individual that answer the um, the survey. And then just keep going. Uh, these population pyramids, I think I showed you that before. In this case here is not micro data, it's data that's already aggregated for a specific a geographic region in a specific year. In this case here, we can see the world population in 2019 and we can look at data for other years, so 2014, uh, 2009, and you can even click here on, the, on this graph here to select a specific year, 1990, 2005, and you can select specific countries as well. So we can go here and look at the population in Mexico in each one of these years, and then you have the whole population in 2005, and the projected population for uh, in 2100. So fertility declining a lot in Mexico. So you're gonna have fewer percentage of children, both men and women. And of course, this data is also available for the US and in this case here, aggregated level data. And also this is the project for 2100. And you can go back to 1950 where you have higher fertility and then more people in those earlier ages. And here you're seeing percentage and as you pass the mouse through it, you have the, the absolute numbers as well. So this more aggregated level, this websites that provide aggregated level information, they are really useful if you are doing a quick analysis, a demographic, socioeconomic or demographic analysis of a specific country, you can get a lot of information in these public websites. This one, oh, and the IPUMS, I showed you this specific one. The CPS is one that we mentioned before, the current population survey. It's that survey that's collected every month in the US. The sample size is smaller than the American Community Survey, and it focuses more on labor market outcomes. I'm working with two 
undergrad students, one of them attending this course here on that launch program, the undergraduate research program in which undergrad students in the last year of their program, they, they develop a thesis with a specific professor. And we are using data for, uh, from IPUMS from this health service, more specifically from the National Health Interview Series. One student focused on pregnant women having more access to health insurance after the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And the other student looking more at mortality and also looking at other sources of data to understand the increase in mortality due to drug overdose in the US. An interesting thing about this survey here, it gets information about people from a specific sample. And then in more recent years, they try to link that data into death certificates. So this, people answer the survey and then afterwards, they link that information to death certificates so we know if that person that answered that specific questionnaire is dead after a couple of, after some years. So it's a lot of stuff that can be done here. And usually when students look for to work with me, I try to exactly use public available data. And I usually focus on more micro data analysis because then the student learns more how to create their own tables, how to create their own graphs and so on. They still can go into those aggregated level websites, but these ones here you learn more throughout the research. And um, another website, uh, the IPOMS I just showed, the population division within the United Nations is the place where you, you can, uh, yeah, where you, you can, you can get data for countries on several different topics in socioeconomic and demographic variables. And um, they are the ones that provide those projections at this point up to 2100. So this is data that you can have from 1950 to 2100. And when you come here, you can get maps, exactly you can get the original data, but if you, um, you can have maps here in this case for population growth rate, total fertility rate, adolescent birth rate, under five mortality rates. And you can also download the data in a table format by coming here and you have data on population, overall population size, by specific subgroups, fertility, mortality. And this data here is available for several countries. So you can download the Excel spreadsheet, and then you're gonna have data from all these different countries. You have them grouped too by level of development, and then you have data for several decades, and then projections for the next decades as well. The projection is here. So after 2020 until 2100, in this case here, we got infant mortality rate and you have that information for all these different countries, right? All information that you can get for free from this website. The, cool, and you have migration data as well. Migration that you have less. And again, here, the information is at the, count, the country level. The, Population division, this population IO, I think it's just really cool. If you just go to this website here, you can put your date of birth and um, that's the day first. The date of birth, so in my case, I was born in Brazil, male and go. And it's just interesting, it just shows you what's the percentage of people that's older than you and the percentage of people that's younger than you. So uh, there are already 68% of the world population that's younger than me. And it kind of compares, it's kind of a little bit depressing <laughs> because then you see that you don't have as many years of life left. 
<laughs> but it's uh, so I'm, I'm expected to live to around 80 years of age, 37 years left, right? And then it shows my age and comparing to the world population where I am in the distribution and also in the Brazilian population. Right, so this is a really aggregated level information, much more simplified, but it's really interesting that you can get all this cool uh, demographic data in a really easy way and really friendly way on different websites. So I really like this website here to put ourselves in perspective. Oh, and yeah, and this one here's the Brazilian population. And I can also um, if I, I'm from Brazil and now I'm living in the United States, so I can write here that I'm now in the US. And so now I'm expecting to live all oh, a couple of years more compared to if I was in Brazil, experience the life conditions in Brazil. So that's good. So 39.7, not 37.3. And of course, all these estimates here are average based on population data. Cool. I could live less or more than that. Uh, the Population Reference Bureau is an organization based in DC and they have this data portal here and um, they usually compile this world population data sheets that a bunch of different indicators for several countries in the world. And here I just selected the US indicators and you can select, for example, total fertility rate and I just do it for the whole country. And then the total fertility rate right now in the US based on 2018 data is 1.73. So women are having on average 1.73 children throughout their South Dakota and 2.15 children per woman and Vermont is the lowest one, 1 1.44. Right, so you can just go here and then you can see, for example, Texas 1.87 and so on. And this is one indicator. There are several other indicators that you can look here. And this is just one of the portals that I'm showing. If you wanna know more data, more details about the US, of course the US Census Bureau website has more data. Cool. This, um, This site here, World Migration Map, it's this one. It gives us an idea of uh, the size of the flows between the countries, among the countries in the world. So in, in here, this is data from 2010 and 2015. And net migration to the US, so the US receives three million more people than send people to other countries. If you click here on the US, then you just look at flows to and from the US. And then if you click, for example, here in China now, then you kind of focus more on flows between these two countries, right? So it's just a, an interesting way to kind of uh, see um, the flows among countries in a really quick way. So the one that we usually talk more, the US and Mexico, you, you have here now the net migration is minus 781,000. So there are more people um, going to Mexico than coming to the US, right? And that's like an interesting way to have a quick view about that. And again, that's data from 2010 and 2015. Um, This other, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees focus on data, collection of data for refugee crisis and so on. And because, because of the civil war in, in Syria, they have this specific website here that they update on a regular basis. For example, now this data is from September 23rd. And they show that most of the people uh, getting out of Syria, they are going to Turkey, but also a considerable amount going to Lebanon, uh, Jordan, and also to Iraq and mostly to the Northern region of Iraq, Kurdistan, and also to Egypt. But most of them 
65% going to Turkey. And you have a graph there, a map there, you have a couple of graphs as well, and the overall age distribution of age and passing through all these issues, they usually have these specific websites where you can collect information. And of course, the UN also collects information about the pandemic, as the other ones that I showed at the beginning of the course. Uh, this is micro data, uh, more micro data uh, sources that in these ones you have the data set and you, the data doesn't come aggregated. It's like one row for each individual that answered the survey. Gapminder is the institution that was funded by Rens Rosling. So just to open another tab here, just to go to the top of our website. In this video here, Hans Rosling, in a specific point, he shows a, a graph by the life expectancy of a, a series of different countries. And yeah, so it's income by life expectancy. And these are some of the videos that he, they, they created in Gapminder. He, he died some years ago, but the Gapminder is still there and being run by his, by his son and some other, several other people. And uh, I got those uh, videos from, uh, uh, done by Hans Rosling from this website here. And you can download that, um, it's pretty much an app that you can download and you can play a little bit with it and then you can select your own country and you can go to a specific year that you want to analyze. And uh, so you can download this, this app in your computer and look at the association between income and life expectancy, right? But if you watch this video here, he gives you an explanation about it and then you can download the app and play with it by yourself. Um, this Opportunity Insights, it's a project uh, now based at Harvard that tried to understand poverty and how poverty is um, an intergenerational issue. Usually people that live in poverty, when they are children, they are more likely to stay in poverty when they get older. And, uh, and that's even stronger among African Americans in, in the US. And um, so let me just get the names correctly here. Like Chad is the, one of the main, so he's an economist. He's one of the main researchers in this team. And uh, let me just, the, the, you can collect, get data from here as well. And they also have a series of different papers that they, they wrote that you can also download from here. Uh, I, it's just, I'm not gonna find it exactly now. Sometimes, I mean, this list of all papers, sorry. These websites, they change. So yeah, Raj Chetty is the main researcher here who is organizing this project, but of course he has huge team that helps him with that. And these are several papers that they are making available, but you can also download specific data. And one place in the US that's known to collect their own data and then release analysis of different aspects of the American society in terms of social trends, demographic, economics, and even political is the Pew Research Center. And they have this specific website in which you can download their data sets, like in this case about politics and policy, journalism, internet, science, religion, Hispanic trends, global attitudes and trends. Each one of those is a different survey that they collected, which is representative to the American population, right? So they have a sample that's representative to the whole country. So these are just like some of the websites that I listed here in our course. And during the election years, I always like to go to see public opinion polls. 538 is known to have one of the most refined 
uh, methods to predict election outcomes. So they get polls from all different uh, institutions, all different agencies, and they they evaluate the, the the quality of those polls and also some other likelihood of people going to vote. And um, and then they have the the forecast. And now this specific year, they are being more careful in terms of like they are actually really trying to estimate the number of electoral votes that the candidates are going to get. But um, in previous years, they were more um, estimating the overall popular vote. So whenever people say that in 2016, the, the election polls were wrong, actually the national polls were correct because they actually were predicting that Hillary Clinton would get three million more votes, which is exactly what she got, but it's popular vote. That's not how the system in the US uh, works. So now you, these different agencies, they are trying to predict more the number of uh, electoral votes that each one of the candidates are expected to have. And uh, I mean, you still have like a month to go, a little more than a month, but it's interesting to see and then we're gonna see the final results afterwards, right? But here, Biden expects winning 80 out of 100 of their simulations, right? Cool. Uh, if some, yeah, nobody asked any questions. So now we go into the chapter about fertility. In this chapter about fertility, you're gonna see in the course website that there are some extra files there. Let me just go there to fertility. And um, you have the example of fertility rates in Excel. It's pretty much one zipped file, one compressed file. If you want to compress it, you're gonna have this uh, fertility rates estimated for Brazil. And also this one's here estimated for the US. And I'm, I'm gonna explain them after I pass through the lecture. And I also have this extra reading here talking about just an article from the New York Times showing that fertility has been declining among Hispanic women as well in the US, right? More recently. So this uh, specific lecture, we, I subdivided here just giving you an idea, an overall idea of different indicators that we can estimate to see the trends and levels of fertility in different countries, in different areas, and also some important concepts related to fertility. And then afterwards, after we estimate the fertility levels and trends with a series of different, different indicators, it's good for us to try to understand what are the factors that are influencing these levels and trends of fertility. And that's what I'm gonna talk here, framework for predicting fertility. A series of different researchers, demographers, trying to come up with models that try to understand what are the factors that make women having, have less or more children. So there's a more conceptual theoretical framework that it's used to afterwards understand the trends and patterns of fertility. And here I'm gonna give you examples of these trends and patterns of fertility in the world, and then focus in the US. And in the US, uh, focus on also on adolescent fertility, non-marital fertility, and also cases of women that don't have children throughout their reproductive lives, and also male fertility that in the textbook, he pretty much emphasized that has not been studied so much and historically, and it's a good, um, topic of study for future decades as well. So um, intercourse, conception, and fertility are all influenced by social and cultural factors. So the number of children that women have, whether people are using contraceptive methods and the frequency of sex, they are all influenced by how our society is organized. 
And there are different ways for us to try to understand the levels of fertility in a specific country or contraceptive use and so on. And these several types of fertility analysis are related to the Delexis diagram that we talked before here. We can have an analysis in which we get data from a specific year in a specific country, and then we will do a period analysis of fertility in that country, so cross-sectional perspective. Cross-sectional because you have several cohorts uh, touching this specific period of data that I'm collecting. So it's based on a particular point or period of time. The cohort analysis is based on fertility patterns for a specific group of people, group of women, who go through childbearing years at the same time. So it's pretty much a group of women having children around the same year. So that's a cohort of women. And in this case, we are trying to understand the characteristics of that specific group of women who are experiencing the same conditions in their society because they are between 15 and 49 years of age around the same years, and they are experiencing the same uh, influences on the chances, the same social and cultural factors influencing their fertility. So in this case here, we are not just analyzing data from one specific year, we are trying to follow women through time. Uh, if we try to do an analysis of fertility, looking at data, collecting data for each woman, how many, if I go and I implement a questionnaire to women and ask, how many children in total do you have? Did you have a child in the last year? Any of your children, uh, you can even link that to mortality. Even your, if any of your children died before completing one year of age. In this case, I'm collecting information for each one of the women that I'm interviewed. So I'm doing a micro analysis. The macro analysis is when I collect information more at the aggregate level. So just think about these websites that we just saw. If I have the micro data, one row for each woman and information about her fertility, for, about their fertility, I can do a micro analysis. I can group those specific subgroups of women in the way that I want. But if I'm more interested in already have the data aggregated, and do a more ecological study like the one that Dudley Poston mentions before with that uh, human ecological framework, then I'm more doing analysis of groups, for example, for countries. So that's a macro analysis. And as we did for those terms related to abortion, stillbirth, and miscarriage in the previous class, it's important for us to understand specific concepts that we're gonna talk here throughout this chapter. And whenever we are talking about fertility, we have to know what's the difference between fertility, reproduction, and fecundity. Fertility is the actual production of males and female births. So if I ask women how many children you had, either in total, or if you had a child in the last year, I'm asking whether the woman had a, either a male or a female baby. It doesn't matter in this case. If I'm counting children being born in a specific place, in a specific year, I'm dealing with fertility studies. If I'm more interested to know how many daughters how many female births a specific woman uh, had, I'm talking about reproduction. Why sometimes I might be more interested on reproduction than fertility? Because the amount of daughters that a woman have, those daughters are going to be the ones having children in the future. So if I wanna see exactly what are the chances of them having children in the future that will replace the older generations, it's more interesting to focus on the levels of female births. And fecundity is more related to the biological capability of producing live births. For those of you here who speak Spanish or Portuguese, these terms are exactly the opposite in Spanish and Portuguese. So fertilidad in Spanish is fecundity in, in English. And fecundidad in Spanish is fertility in English. So if you are reading 
a paper, a demographic paper in Spanish, the terms will be exactly the opposite, right? But fertility here in English related to the actual number of children that women had, reproduction, the number of daughters that the women had, and fecundity is their biological capaci capacity of having live birth. So it's more biological information. And the, the standard that demographers usually use to count how many children and daughters women had throughout their lives, usually we have this interval, this age range from 15 to 49. So 15 to 49 is usually the, the age range that we call it the reproductive ages of women. Yeah, some women have children below the age of 15 and some women above the age of 49. But this is a standard that we have been using because that's where the highest chances of having children happen. And also we have more historical data that we can compare them to. But as we're gonna see even in this lecture, we can also focus on adolescent fertility, including women below the age of 15, right? So, but overall the ages from 15 to 49 are the main ages when women are able to give birth. Sometimes the age group of 15 to 44 is used, especially in developed countries, because there are so few births happening to one between 45 and 49. Right? Other terms in fertility that are important for us to understand. So we talked before, fertility is the actual production of births, how many children a woman had. Infertility is the childlessness either voluntary or involuntary. So women not having children either because they don't want to or because they cannot have children because of biological issues. Fecundity is the ability to, reprodu to reproduce. And in some cases, you might have some, uh, not like you have like 100% of chance of having a child or 100% of not having a child. You have different levels. So the, the, the fitnessly sterile, probably sterile, semi-fecund and fecundity intermediate. So you have all these different levels that you can, you can uh, try to measure for a specific woman. But in this case here, it's more related to biological factors as we saw in the previous slide. That's not usually the main focus of demographers. Demographers are usually more concerned with the actual number of children that women are having. But we can also try to understand what are the biological factors behind them having more or less children. And in fecundity, exactly the opposite of fecundity is the, uh, it's pretty much sterility. It's like the non ability of having children. Some other uh, factors are important, like other concepts in fertility are important for us, menarche, menopause, and postpartum, because they tell us moments in which women are more or less enter the reproductive ages and have chances to have uh, children and when they exit, and also specific moments in which they have lower chances of having children. So men are at the beginning of the female reproductive period, the first, the first menstrual flow. It marks the moment where biologically women are able to have children. Maybe like if they get pregnant at really young ages, it can pose a, a health a concern for, for a specific woman, for a specific child. But that's uh, an important information for uh, people to know when they're biologically able to have children. Menopause, end of reproductive period, that's the termination of menstruation, so women cannot have children after the menopause. And the postpartum period is also important. What is the postpartum period? It's a period of infecundability following a, pre a pregnancy, a function of the duration and intensity of lactation. So women, right after they have children and they start breastfeeding their children, throughout that process in which they're breastfeeding their children, they are much less likely to get pregnant again. So if the duration of the breastfeeding period is longer, then those women will have even fewer chances of have, um, getting pregnant again throughout that, that time.
And again, the, I forgot to mention, but the chat disappears when I click on these slides. If you want to ask any questions, just do it. Uh, just unmute yourselves. Thank you. Okay, now we know these major concepts in fertility. Now we're going to go into the indicators. The simplest indicator to try to understand the overall number of births in a specific society is the crude birth rate. It's cross-sectional. It's information that is usually collected for a specific country or geographic uh, area in a specific year. And you pretty much get the number of births occurring in a specific population divided by the population in, in the middle of that specific year and multiplied by 1,000. In this case here, it's called a birth rate. The numerator has both male births and female births. So why it's not called fertility rate because the numerator has male and female births? Because the denominator has the population including men and women. In this case, because the denominator has men and women, is called a birth rate, not a fertility rate. And it's called a crude birth rate because I'm just getting the overall number of male babies and uh, female babies being born in a specific year and divided by the population of men and women, not taking into account the age of the parents, right? But the denominator here includes the male and the female population. That's why it's a birth rate and not a fertility rate. And this is an example of fruit birth rates in the US from that website that I showed to you uh, before from the UN World Population Prospects that they have projections up to 2100. So back in 1950, 1955, around 24 uh, babies were born around that period for every 1000 people in the US. And that's people including men and women. And then it declined over time and now it has been a little bit more stable and it's expected to be more stable in these next decades, right? So we are around here right now. And um, the general fertility rate, see, it changed the name from crude birth rate into general fertility rate. It's also cross-sectional information from a specific place in a specific year. The numerator is the same one as we had before, number of births, both boys and girls. And the denominator, it's only the female population in reproductive years between 15 and 49 and multiply by 1000 exactly because this number can get really small. Now, because the denominator has only the female population, it's a fertility rate. It's called a general fertility rate because we are not calculating the rates for each one of the subgroups of ages within this interval. We are getting all women within the uh, reproductive ages of 15 to 49. Let's say that for some developing countries, I don't know exactly the female population. I just know the overall population of that specific country because of lack of data. I just know the overall number of men and women in that population. So I can calculate the crude birth rate. But let's say for that specific country, I don't have the female population, but I can calculate the crude birth rate. A way to indirectly estimate the general fertility rate is to get the crude birth rate and multiply by uh, 4.5 if data for crude birth rate is the only one available, right? But now we are talking about fertility rate, not birth rate, because the denominator, it's only the female population, does not include men in the denominator. So these are, this is a graph uh, with live births, the number of live births here in, in medians, that's the, um, blue line here, and then overall number comes here in the 
the left vertical axis. And here in the green curve, you have the general fertility rate. The general fertility rate, exactly the number of births, this number of births here, divided by women between the ages of 15 and 49. So why do you think that the number, overall number of births of women has been increased in the US between 1980 and 2010, for example, from around a little over three million to around four million, but the rate in the vertical axis here on the right has become kind of stable, around 60 uh, births for every 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 44. So just one thing first, 15 to 44, not 15 to 49, which is related to that other slide that we, I mentioned before, that in more developed countries, such as the, the US, sorry, I should have this information here, right? And this is the US, the, you have um, lower chances of having babies at between the ages of 45, 49. That's why it goes only until 44 years of age. So why these numbers here are increasing, but the rate is kind of stable? It has to do with the denominator of the formula. The number of women in reproductive ages in the US has actually also been increasing because the population is increasing in these last decades. The denominator is increasing. The num numerator is also increasing. If you divide one by the other, if the increase is proportionally the same, the rate doesn't change as much, stays kind of stable over time, right? It's just because the numerator, which is showing here, is increasing around the same rate as the denominator in the same pace. Let's not use another word. The numerator is increasing the same pace as the denominator of the formula, which is the population of women between uh, the reproductive ages. So the rate, the general fertility rate stays stable over time. I have to add to this slide here. This is related to the US and it's not included here. The, I have to check what I really think is about the US, but I will check it and I will let you know in the next class. Then we can start being a little bit more specific because it's important for us to know better what's the chances of women to have children, not overall between the ages of 15 and 49, because so, some countries might have younger women between the ages of 20 and 24 that are more likely to have children and other countries might have more older women, for example, between the ages of 40 and 44 who have fewer chances of having children. So we can calculate the age-specific fertility rates, the ASFR. It's pretty much the birth rates of women for each one of these age groups here. Because here we are taking into account the age composition of women in a specific country in a specific year. It's usually calculated for women in each one of the seven five-year age groups listed here from 15 to 49. Sometimes uh, we can also use single year information, so 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, until 49. But usually this information for single years, it's more reliable for developed countries, developing countries that don't have so much reliable information to do such a detailed analysis. So if we wanna compare internationally, the standards to do these five year age groups. How exactly you estimate the age-specific fertility rates. The notation, this is a standard notation among demographers. If you have this notation here, ASFR XN, what does it mean? That's the age-specific fertility rate for the age group from age X to X plus N. So how would be the notation for the, um, the first age group, 15 to 19, would be ASFR 15, five, right? So that's the width of the interval. 
So that would be the age-specific fertility rate from 15 until 19 years of age, including 15. So that's why it's five, right? Up to the moment before they reach 20 years of age. How do you calculate it? You get the number of births to women in a specific age group and divide by the total number of women in that same age group. And you usually multiply this rate by 1,000 because the values get really small. This fertility rate, this age-specific fertility rates, they have usually a, a typical pattern. So the a typical trend. If we plot this age-specific fertility rates by these age groups, it usually have an inverted U shape, like this one here, an inverted U shape. So these are the age-specific fertility rates for the seven five-year age groups. And as women get a little older, around the ages of 20 and 25, they, get, they have higher chances of having children. And then afterwards, as they get older, the chances of having children fall a lot. This is data for Africa, the green line from 1970 to 75, and the, um, the purple one from 2005 to 2010. And you see that the overall levels of fertility decline a lot in Africa in this, between these years. And here, just to give an example, uh, in between 2005 and 2010, around 100 babies were born for every 1,000 women in Africa between the ages of 15 and 19, right? And this number gets really small, like around only 25 births for every 1,000 women between the ages of 45 and 49 in Africa in this last time period. Oh, in Europe, if you compare the two graphs, they have the same vertical axis here going to up to 350. You see that the levels of fertility in Europe is much uh, smaller than in Africa. In Africa, we saw an overall drop in the rates. Here in Europe, you see something really clear. I mean, in Africa, you can see a little bit too, but here in Europe, you see even more. Like you see a drop of fertility in the age group of 20 to 24 and also 25 to 29 for exactly those same time periods. But you see that women between 30 and 34, they increase the chance of having babies in these more recent years. This is the process that a lot of developed countries experience of postponement of fertility. In younger ages, women, they um, invest more in their education. They try to get good jobs. So they postpone marriage and they also postpone having children. And then you see these trends of increasing fertility in younger, in older ages and declining fertility in uh, younger ages. Right. When you have this data here, you have pretty much like seven rates calculated for each one of these time periods for a specific geographical area. Sometimes you might want to have just one indicator to summarize that. And I want to have one indicator that takes into account the age composition of that population. So you can use this age-specific fertility rates to calculate the total fertility rate. So the total fertility rate is the most popular me measure of fertility. It's mostly cross-section. You usually collect information for a specific country in a specific year, but it can also be calculated for specific cohorts. How do you calculate it? Is the number of births that a hypothetical group of 1,000 women would produce during their reproductive years. So you pretty much get all the age-specific fertility rates, the seven age-specific fertility rates that you have, multiplied by the width of the age group, which is usually five, and sum them all, right? So you just get, you get them all, each one of them, 
multiply by five and sum them. Or you can sum them all first and then multiply by five. And you get the total fertility rate. The age-specific fertility rate that we calculated in this slide before, we multiply by 1,000. When we multiply by 1,000 and we do this, it's giving us the number of births that this group of women would, this 1,000 group of women would produce. If I wanna have that information for a single woman, I can just divide the total fertility rate by 1,000. Or I can simply don't multiply the age-specific fertility rates by 1,000. What is this thing here called the hypothetical group? What does it mean? If you go back to this previous graph here, in 2005, 2010, women between 15 and 19 years of age, they had this chance here of having children, right? This one here, around 25 children for 1,000 women. When they get older and they reach the ages of 20 and 24, we are not in 2005 anymore. This woman, when they reach 20 to 24, we're gonna be in 2010 to 2015, right? So this data that we are showing here in this graph is for women of different ages in that specific time period. But if we get all these rates here, the seven rates, age specific fertility rates, sum them all, multiply by five and get that information of the total fertility rate, we are pretty much saying, let's get a group of women, a hypothetical group of women, and make them experience these fertility rates here between the ages of 15 and 49, all throughout their reproductive lives. How many children on average they would have? Why is it called a hypothetical cohort, a hypothetical group of women? Because this group doesn't really exist because when this woman here from 15 to 19 reaches the ages of 20, 24, the age specific fertility rate is gonna be different, probably lower. So these are not really a woman when I get, make this exercise, when I estimate this total fertility rate. I'm just saying, let's get a group of women and make them be exposed to these fertility rates that we calculated for this specific time period in this specific place how many children on average they would have. That's what the total fertility rate is giving us, right? And that's a, a graph for the US. And see, this author got this information from the Population Reference Bureau, that website that I showed to you before. And this is the total fertility rate calculated for several years. In the graph for eight specific fertility rates, we have only two time periods. We just have the, the green and the purple lines here for two different time periods. Here, we have one total fertility rate for each one of these years. And the main idea of this um, graph is try to show that the trends in fertility are kind of driven by major economic um, experience that the, the country lived. So you had the Great Depression around the 30s. People lose their jobs. So people tend to postpone fertility, postpone marriage, postpone fertility. Fertility drops a lot. And then after World War II, after 1949, you have an economic prospect, an economic development in the country, better job opportunities. And then you have the baby boom. People start to have more children. And then fertility starts to decline in the 60s and 70s because of contraception, because now women start to um, invest in their education and get better jobs. And then they delay uh, marriage, they delay fertility. So fertility is related also to that, a society that gives more equal opportunities or at least more similar opportunities for women as they do for men. And around the 1970s, you had the energy crisis that make it drop really fast as well. And then it bounces back in the 90s, end of the 80s and the 90s, and then uh, in the early 2000s. And then in 2008, when you get, get the Great Recession, 
you see a decline in fertility as well. A lot of people were kind of like making jokes, oh, with the coronavirus pandemic, people will be confined at home and then fertility will probably increase in those countries. What historical data shows you is exactly the opposite. What is the coronavirus pandemic caused us in the US? And that was really clear based on data from CPS, from the current population survey. On the current population survey, you had a huge drop on employment rate in the country. So that's an economic impact of the pandemic. It bounced back a little bit, but it didn't bounce back to the same levels as we had before. It's still down. And so this uh, recession, this uh, economic recession that we experienced because of the pandemic now in 2020, probably will have a negative effect on total fertility rates in the US as well, all right? So what historical data shows us is exactly during this pandemic, which affects economics, the, the economy of the country, uh, higher rates of unemployment, and people start to lose their jobs, and then you start to have uh, the effect on fertility, lower fertility among the population. Let's say that we don't have all that detailed information to calculate the total fertility rate, because what do we need there? It's a lot of information, right, that we have to have. We need number of births for women in each one of these age groups, and also the population of women in each one of these age groups, the seven five-year age groups. So a lot of countries might not have that information. If we don't have that information, but let's say that we have the, the general fertility rate information, that which is pretty much the number of uh, uh, births divided by the population of women in reproductive ages, we can just get the general fertility rate and multiply by 30. Let's say that we don't even, even, we don't have even that, the population of women to put in the denominator. We just have the population of men and women in the denominator. So we can get the crude birth rate, multiply by 0.4, uh, multiply by 4.5 and by 30 to kind of estimate how the total fertility rate is. But of course, it's not gonna be a, such a refined measure as if we had all that detailed information about number of births in population of women for those five year age groups. And period total fertility rates, we, as is discussed in the textbook, is preferred over cohort total fertility rates because we want to know how is the situation of fertility right now, right now during the pandemic, women of all different age groups, what are their chances of having children? I don't wanna know, for example, the women who are now, it's not, I can also uh, try to investigate, for example, women now who are 40 uh, to 44, 20 years ago in 2000, they were 20 to 24 years of age. I can kind of, try to estimate how their fertility was back then when they were 20 and 24, and then get their information of fertility throughout those reproductive ages to calculate a cohort total fertility rate. So it's kind of like I'm following a group of women through time and try to understand their fertility. The issue is that usually when we are trying to understand uh, the, the, the trends of total fertility rates, we want to know how is the situation right now in the country? And we do that hypothetical exercise. Let's just, let's just do an exercise in which a group of women experience this, all these eight specific fertility rates that we are measuring for this year. If we calculate a cohort total fertility rate, following women through time and kind of looking how many children they had for each one of these five year age groups, in that case, I don't have a hypothetical cohort. I have a real cohort of women that I follow through time and I measure their fertility in each one of these age groups, all right? The period TFR, I'm doing the hypothetical exercise, but it's more interesting for me because I know exactly how is the overall situation of the country right now in a specific year. 
Whenever we have analysis of fertility, it's interesting for us to try to understand how would be the fertility levels if there was no control of fertility. And when we have the situation in which you have fertility in a specific country with no measure to try to control fertility, you have the natural fertility. So that's the level of reproduction in a specific country and specific year in the absence of deliberate fertility control. And these authors, Henry, Cole, and Trussell, estimated that when there is no contraception use, usually in women are in good health, usually on average they have between six and seven live birth for each one of these women. And they also emphasize that 25% of the completed fertility is due to genetics. So it's not only related to socioeconomic factors. And as we talked before, to, we, we talked before about um, migration. Migration is influenced by social, economic, and cultural factors. Fertility and mortality also have a component that is explained by biology. Migration more like related to socioeconomic and cultural factors, fertility as well, but also to biology. But then some demographers kind of realized that there is a group of women, the Hutterites, that they had around 11 children per woman back in the 1930s. Who are the, the Hutterites? They're an ethno-religious group that formed in the early 16th century. And nowadays, most of them are living in South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and Western Canada. And they had some interesting characteristics. Early age at marriage, good diet, good medical care, regularly engaged in intercourse without contraception and without abortion. And their total fertility rate was around 11 children per woman. So 11 children on average. You could say, oh, a lot of like developing countries, for example, in Africa, you still don't have access to contraceptive methods. Women are uh, engaged in intercourse in early ages and so on. But in those countries, in those developing countries, even nowadays, there is still high mortality because of Issues of like not good diet, not good medical care. So those countries nowadays in Africa countries, for example, that have high fertility, but it's still high mortality, high infant mortality. They are not good cases to understand natural fertility because of still low levels of health indicators. But for the heterides, they are good because of reproductive behavior early uh, marriage, but also good uh, health care, health um, environment where they live. And this is a graph that kind of shows, puts us in perspective of how high the age-specific fertility rates are for the heterides. This one from the 1930s that gives us 11 children per woman on average. How do I get that? I get each one of these seven uh, age specific fertility rates, which are here. Sum them all, multiply by five, and then divide by 1000 because the age specific fertility rates are multiplied by 1000. And you can compare for uh, fertility rates estimated for Mexico in 2010, the US in 2010, and Canada. What you see first is that heterides fertility and the natural fertility is much higher than in these three countries. When you compare these three countries, you see Mexico has higher fertility than the U.S. and Canada in younger ages, but what the U.S. and Canada are experiencing is similar to what Europe, Europe is experiencing, postponement in fertility. So older women here in the U.S., those between the ages of 30 and 34, have higher chances of having children also in Canada than in Mexico compared to Mexico, right? So you see a huge difference to the natural fertility of the heterides to these more contemporary societies. But even within the contemporary societies, you see this postponement in fertility. 
Uh, and then we go into the other concept that we saw before, reproduction. Now, why it's not called fertility anymore? Because the numerator of this, for, this indicator, more specific, the gross reproduction rate, includes only female births, does not include male births. So it uses the same uh, formula, similar formula as the total fertility rate, but now the numerator of this age-specific fertility rate is only female births. So it's only female births being considered. So you calculate the age, the female age-specific fertility rates, considering only female births in the numerator and the denominator only women. And that this one is called the gross reproduction rate. And it's based on this term reproduction. It's, uh, it's used exactly because now in the numerator of this formula, we are just calculating, we are just getting the number of female births and not male births. And it's based on the concept of population replacement. And the total fertility rate, we should have two children, around two children, in order to replace their parents, the mother and the father. You're gonna see there should be around 2.1 children. The gross reproduction rate should be one, around one. Because then, if a woman have a one daughter, woman in a specific country, and specifically you have one daughter on average, that daughter will replace them in order to have children in the future, right? So we are out of time now, and I will continue on these uh, rates, talk about the net reproduction rate. And after I, I finish this part of the mean length of a generation, then I will show you examples on this Excel spreadsheet from the US, how to estimate each one of these rates with real data, okay? And I will check that uh, slide with the general reproduction rate. I really think it's about the US, but I will check it and we'll let you know. So thank you very much. The quiz is open right now, quiz nine. And until noon tomorrow, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you very much.